Uh, well, this podcast is about you and your journey in music and uh -huh. uh, William the Conqueror and your new record. Very nice, man. Very cool. Well, first of all, tell me where did you, where were you born and raised? I was born in Edinburgh in Scotland, um, but I wasn't raised there. I was uh, raised mostly in Cornwall as a kid, although I lived a couple of other places first. Um, and then when I was about 13 or 14, I moved to New Zealand wow. and I lived there till I was about 17 or 18. And then I moved back to England uh, and grab ended up back in Cornwall. Though. I had a couple of stints in London, but okay. sort of not, not from anywhere, really. Just from wow. London. But going from from there to, to New Zealand, that must have been quite a change, especially at 13. Yeah, 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 exactly. That age where you're just starting to form your friendship groups and everything. It was a, <laughs> right. it was a big change. Yeah. But yeah. it was good. You know, you, you get to reinvent yourself um, if you move, you know, a big distance like that. So I was I was all good with it. It was good fun. Right. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Well, how did how did you get into music? Um, I don't know. It just it <clears throat> I grew up. My dad was obsessed with um, Bob Dylan to the point where it's, it's all he played in the house growing up up until my parents split up when, when I was about 11. So I always just thought that that was what music was and must have been around 11 years old. I discovered a guitar in the house and just, just took an interest in it, um, learned a couple of chords and that was kind of it really. Just the idea of the song opened up to me because, because my dad was so obsessed with Bob Dylan mm -hmm. and I hadn't heard anything other than that before. One day he came home with a, a cassette tape of um, Guns N' Roses covering Knocking on Heaven's Door. Oh, okay. that, was the, that, was, that was the only reason Guns N' Roses were allowed in the house was because they played <laughs> a Bob Dylan they, song. Yeah. And you could, in the one, in one uh, Hendrix song, get cut through. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but there was something about that. I just remember the magic of like realizing that songs weren't, I don't know what I thought of as a kid, but that it was this, it was something else like the representation of the song. Anybody could do it, but the song was this kind of magic thing that you couldn't, touch you could you could reinterpret it and so i just got straight into songwriting just just making stuff up you know with the oh with the wow chords i had yeah yeah so it's, uh, in, instead of learning dylan songs it was just sort of writing your own songs yeah i mean i learned you know obviously obviously i learned some stuff to, to help me along the way i don't remember learning a great deal of dylan other than knocking on heaven's door but <laughs> um the key was like my so when i showed an interest in the guitar my dad he had three things that he could play. One was knocking on heaven's door or Dylan stuff. So there's a few chords there. Another thing was um, famous blue raincoat by Leonard Cohen, which is like the kind of picking yeah, the thing. finger picking. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And then the other thing was actually my stepbrother taught me. It was a riff. Do you know the song standing on shaky ground? Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, do -dum, bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum, no, bum, bum, no. It's an no. old, like, it's not deep purple, but it's someone from that era, you know, it's kind okay. of seventies. So, the, so I learned the three sort of core things that you need in a song straight away, which is chords, picking and riffs. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just, yeah, my brain exploded. I was off. I was absolutely wow. off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the guitar was that your dad's guitar that was at the house yeah or? yeah okay. so I didn't, I didn't i didn't know this but when he was at um when he was at university he used to do little gigs and stuff just playing leonard cohen covers and, and things like oh that. wow i had no idea until i was an adult that he used to do that yeah that's cool yeah, that's really cool. cool so he obviously uh encouraged you to play once you took interest to it oh big time yeah well i think i think if if your kids uh, do you have kids i do i have two yeah yeah so if they show an interest in something that means you can shut them in a room and they just get on with something constructive <laughs> <laughs> it's great do so, it. yeah, I, was, I was very much encouraged to, to play the guitar definitely yeah that's awesome so when yeah. you started writing you said 11 was when you started playing yeah yeah 11, okay 12 yeah yeah and f did when like you had obviously you moved a couple of years after that to to new to zealand, zealand yeah. were you like you know just playing were you playing with kids around your your area at that time or was it all just kind of yeah Here's, yeah yeah absolutely well because it because grunge hit grunge kind of hit the mainstream around like 92 93 so i was mm -hmm. ripe for that so i fell into the world of nirvana and okay pearl jam and you know everything like that um so starting a band was was absolutely the most important thing to do straight away we start a band so we didn't have a drummer but we had two electric guitars and a bass guitar just me and a couple of buddies and um yeah, started a band straight away, did our first gig when I was like 13, 
like <laughs> with no drummer so it was just a, <laughs> a wall of distortion but that's awesome just totally hooked um uh, and then originals at that time yeah, all, all originals yeah oh wow that's <laughs> yeah. amazing i know it's pretty well, nuts so where did you moment. guys play was it like a <clears throat> like a talent show or a, no, no, it was, a, it was a, we supported a, we opened for a band at this pub called the watering hole, which is in Perrinport. It's like a pub that sits on the beach. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Some band needed an opener and I don't, I don't know how we got it. We got paid. <laughs> um, we got paid in pints of Coca-Cola. So well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But it was, I was hooked, man. The minute, the minute my voice came through those big speakers, you know, I just remember, I can remember the buzz. I just totally remember the buzz. So mm -hmm. yeah. Was that's hooked. awesome and yeah, well, cool. the, obviously the, the, the band had to break up when you moved did yeah you, yeah did you continue did you find a new group of kids to play with oh, uh, yeah, once yeah, you got there yeah yeah, yeah. so i this is what the first thing i did when i started school in new zealand was head straight to the music department and see if anyone was around that was similar and there was plenty of guys a, a cool guy called joseph salmon who played bass and was into the same sorts of music so yeah pretty quickly started another band over there i can't remember what we were called but uh, but yeah, be, being in bands was always the thing. Definitely the thing. I had we had a punk band again. I can't remember the name of it. Something really lame. But anyway, <laughs> just just any any band where it, you could write songs and um, and and play. Okay, that was just my thing. Yeah, yeah. And when did when did it become like you know a serious effort? Like, did you go to university for for music or no no um <clears throat> so when i was 17 18 i think i was 17 i'd i well i lived in like a farming town in new zealand where there was mm -hmm. nothing really around um and this was pre lord of the rings as well so there's no film industry <laughs> or anything okay but I, was, but I knew i wanted to do music or drama or something like that mm -hmm. um and being in new zealand it, 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 where we lived it just didn't seem like it was going to be possible so i quit school and i moved back to england with the sole intention of moving to London and pestering record labels to see if I could get signed. So that was the first time I kind of took it seriously. <clears throat> and I ended up moving to London and making some demos and, and going into record label reception areas and playing my CD to the, <laughs> the poor bastard behind the counter um, and failing miserably. You know, I got my ass handed to me basically. And, and so I, I kind of quit and became a, I'd met my wife and, and, um, we got pregnant when, when I was still like only 19. Mm -hmm. um, so music became a back burner thing, just a hobby for a while while I sure. got a job. And I went back to university and studied film. And Oh, wow. And it was just coming out of that. I think it, after my last year of uh, university, just for fun, because I always, because like, like I say, writing songs was like a hobby anyway. I'd never really thought about doing anything with it. It was just something I did. But I had this big buildup of songs and just to make some extra cash when I finished uni, I started doing gigs at the weekends um, mm -hmm. and it all happened really quickly. You know, I did, a, I did a few open mics in London and this was back in the days of MySpace. So, you know, if you had a MySpace page, the A&R scouts were kind of always on there. So I, ju I just sure. got spotted and signed and picked up. This was as a, as a solo artist and signed to a wow. um, record label, Atlantic Records. Wow, like that's a huge six, deal. I know, yeah, no, it was nuts, man. Looking back, it's crazy. At the time, it was like, of course, this is happening. This is meant to happen, but <laughs> it was insane. Um, just all too quick. Like the album was out within six months, and um, and then I was kind of in. It was like, oh right, so I guess I'm a professional musician now. <laughs> right. Whoa. Did so, they put uh, you on yeah. tour for that record? Or like, uh -huh, was that yeah, the first yeah. time you ever like when you put the album together? Was that the first time you recorded in like a proper studio, or had you ever done that? Um, with, no, I'd, I'd made demos before. With the demos, and okay. Stuff, yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't like uh, intimidated by the recording process or anything. But I did play everything myself on the first like three records, solo records I made because um, I didn't have a band and I had kids and stuff, so I didn't really have the time to rehearse or I just could, it was just easier to be a solo musician. Mm -hmm. So I used to play everything as well, but um, yeah, it didn't, it didn't work out with the, with the record label, not through any kind of, you know, malice or I don't know, you know, those like horror stories of people. Getting right. dropped. I didn't have any of that. I was friends with them all. And I think nobody really knew where to put me or how to sell me or anything like that. So, so I left the record label and, Put a, put a record out myself, my second album, just trying to figure out who I was and what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And ended up kind of doing that for another couple of albums. I made four albums on my own. Oh, wow. Um, and then, yeah, just hit a wall, really. Just, 
I think because it was my name on the poster and there was, I had some sort of identity crisis where it didn't make sense to me that I, I, I fell into the folk world kind of accidentally because I had a beard and I played the acoustic guitar. So it was like, well, he's a folky. <laughs> he's a folk, a folk artist. Tour. So, so he was doing these, doing these folk tours and I built up an audience and that was my living. So I didn't want to like let, when you're in that position, um, thinking about what the fans are going to want becomes mm. kind of m part of your uh, mindset when you're writing. So I realized after like four albums, I wasn't really doing it for me anymore. I was sort of doing it for, I don't know, whoever was in my head at the time of writing. So yeah, I felt like I needed to change and do something else. And so I started experimenting with this under the name William the Conqueror, just off the radar, just playing gigs on my own again. Um, and not not really caring what I did and not doing it for anybody else but myself. Were you uh, sorry, were you trying to like you said with your solo project, were you trying to cater to like were you trying to write something to kind of cater to an audience or was it just you were it's just not so much that it's like it, it's more like um <clears throat> um I'm mean, I'm not bad mouthing the folk world at all. I've got I, I owe a huge debt to them, you know, they kind of gave me a living for a while, but they're quite traditional in their um, restrictions so mandolin acoustic guitars there's a certain sound to it and a certain um, uh, subjects that you're supposed to kind of sing about and you're supposed to tell a lot of stories on stage and I was just never very good at that stuff and I never was that comfortable with it and also the threat of going electric or playing in a minor key you know all these oh, weird sure. little things that kind of hang over you I just wanted to get rid of all of that so so the William the Conqueror project started not with the intention of doing anything with it other than you know in between work just 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 playing for fun mm -hmm. but it's it's sort of snowballed <laughs> and turned into your full time and now time. We're here. yeah yeah, yeah. And okay it was, it was totally the right thing to do i remember telling people at the time when i came up with it <clears throat> that i was going out playing under the name william the conqueror and, and nobody seemed to make any sense of it it just seemed like this really dumb thing to do because i had a career a perfectly adequate career you know i was on tour every year and got to make records but um yeah, I'm glad I pushed through and ignored the sage advice from my um, you know, people that cared about me. Sure. You, when you toured as a solo artist, were you like opening up for for people? Were you able to tour outside of the UK? Like, how was? Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, bits bits and bobs. Most mostly UK, but little bits in Ireland, little bits in Europe here and there, um, like in in uh, Holland and Switzerland mm -hmm. and Germany. Um, and it was mostly on my own, although. The, the the times that I could afford it, I'd take a backing band, which would just be like a three piece. Um, and that was my friends, Harry and Naomi. And when we started playing together more as a band, the, the it didn't seem right that we were performing under my name because we had a chemistry that was, we felt like a band. So that kind of drip fed into the William the Conqueror thing when I told them about it. And um, and that's how William was formed really. Just, oh, just through the that. three of you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then what was, so instead of yeah just it was you as william the conqueror it was now a band as well yeah the yeah essentially Got yeah it. Well, okay. it, was, it, was, it was it was meant to be it was meant to be uh knowingly ambiguous so it was like sometimes i was william the conqueror sometimes the band was william the conqueror um, <laughs> okay so there's, there's also a book there's a novel i wrote called william the conqueror about a kid called william who's this fictitious character so it's all these different things it's not meant to be uh, and that I think that's me pushing back against the idea of being boxed in by a genre, but when mm -hmm. I was supposedly a, a singer songwriter, uh -huh. um, that's what you get labeled as all the time. So being William the Conqueror means that actually there's, I'm in charge of what it is and, and who it is and sure. what he wants to do. So it's just, it just, it just leaves the, the canvas open for the future. You know, mm -hmm. do you remember the moment like when William the Conqueror became the full-time gig versus the solo project? um yeah i mean it was it was a slow uh progression like it was a very natural organic thing it was never like a, a, a meeting where we got together and said right this is the plan okay it just felt right it just felt like the rory joseph gigs were kind of sliding away maybe to do with my enthusiasm kind of waning or something or i don't know for whatever reason the the william gigs were kind of gaining this strange momentum because it was seems such like an odd concept that somebody had the nuts to call themselves William the Conqueror and just <laughs> play these weird rock songs. Um, and it just, it, like I say, it just happened organically. I think I tried one more time, like as a sort of 
before I was tempted to throw in the towel on music entirely and just do something else. Um, mm -hmm. But I, but I thought maybe as one last roll of the dice, I'd make one more record as a solo artist, but make a, make a trilogy, like a triple album, this really high concept thing with all these different ideas going on. So I had that and I was in touch with a few independent record labels about perhaps signing to them. Um, and a record label came down to see us uh, called Loose. Have you ever heard of them? Loose Music? They do like the Felice Brothers and the Handsome Family and um, very, very cool record. Oh, label. cool. No. Yeah. So they, they came down to see us and um, I didn't they, I didn't meet them. They, they, they left before the end of the show and I got this email from them saying, um, while we enjoyed the show, you know, thanks for the show, but it's not sufficiently exciting for us at, at this juncture or something. It's, and I remember that as being a key moment as to saying, okay, do you know what? Fuck Rory Joseph, <laughs> fuck this solo stuff, I've had enough. So then about, so th at that point we started actually actively trying to advertise or not advertise, but promote the idea of William the Conqueror and get a few festivals and start booking gigs and things. And about a year later, we played at a showcase for the Americana Music Association and we played our set Bearing in mind, this is the same three people that were, you know, the right. Ray Joseph guys. Uh -huh. um, we played our set and I went to, I went outside to move the car or something. And a guy came up to Naomi, the bass player and said, wow, you guys are amazing. You could take over the world. And it turned out it was the same dude that had seen us a year before. <laughs> and, uh, and turned Did you call down. him out? Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and awesome. there's, a, there's a lyric in, in the, a song on the first album as well. It says, silly me to think I could excite so sufficiently. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, big time I called him out on it. Yeah, yeah. But we ended up putting out the first record with them and we, we you know, we stayed friends and it was, um, but that was a nice moment, you know, where you kind of been validated i guess sure yeah i was gonna say yeah. that's probably pretty validating <laughs> yeah, considering time, the yeah, fact that it was yeah. a year to, later to go from not sufficiently exciting enough to you can take over the world i think that's right quite, that's quite a good leap yeah <laughs> we were happy with that amazing amazing and so then he, he or the label that he worked for put out uh proud disturber of the peace mm -hmm. that's right okay yeah, yeah yeah wow tell me so with what with that album, were you guys able to tour? Did you kind of yeah. adopt yeah, some yeah. of this fan base that you had prior with your um, solo project as well, or no? I think, yeah, some of them. There was there was definitely like a transitional period where we lost some fans. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, a very, very minor version of it, but you know you know the famous Dylan tour where he went electric? Oh, sure. <laughs> like a really, <laughs> a really naff crap version of that where... <laughs> people would come up and tell me that you know they missed the old song so i was, didn't didn't play anything i just kind of i, I threw it all the way just, it wasn't oh, doing wow. any of the old stuff only yeah. only new yeah only, yeah so probably was, on was, that record at the time right exactly yeah so it was a complete refresh so we had fans come up and say they were disappointed we weren't playing the old stuff or that the drums were too loud and <laughs> things like that <laughs> But it was cool. We stuck to our guns and, and got through it. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, created, just started from scratch again, basically from the from the pub circuit all the way back up again, you know, all the way wow. through. So yeah, it was, it was a good thing. It was a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. And with the, the next record you guys did was Bleeding on the Soundtrack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what was the like big milestone moment? Do you remember from that album? Like, or was there quite a bit of progression from that first record? Well, th so the albums are, 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 they're all linked. All three of our records are linked. They're a trilogy. Oh, okay. I wasn't so the, aware of that. Yeah. So the first one is the is the child of the situation, and then the second, bleeding on the soundtrack, is the father, and then this new one, Maverick Thinker, is the mother. Mm -hmm. Oh, but they interesting. Tell, they, they, they tell the story of like going from innocence into dis into disillusionment, and then into faith. So with each album, you have like a slightly different perspective on uh, the same stories about the same, you know, the essentially my childhood, you know, which is what William the Conqueror kind of rotates around. Mm -hmm. um, but with the, so with the first album, which was about innocence, the idea was just to get together in a garage and smash a load of songs out as fast as possible. So we made that album in like three days Whoa. and um, put it out that way. But then by the time we got to the come to make the second record, we made friends with like the Americana circuit and um, we played an awards show. One of our songs was up like nominated for an award for like best single or something. So we got to play this award show that Ethan Johns was managing musical director of. And in the sound check, <clears throat> we were doing our sound check and Ethan came up to us and just, just told us that he really liked our band and would like to work with us. So that was a kind of a big moment where we stepped wow. away from being these kind of dorks in our garage. Um, uh -huh. And yeah, so we made the second record with Ethan, which was just a huge learning curve. We learned so much from him. Um, 
that was pretty awesome. But wow. Uh, well, yeah. did you know going into it that like like when you went into that second record, did you know it was gonna be a part two of of a series? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that was yeah, always was the, the idea from day one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And a, okay. and a, and a, and a big bulk of the um, songwriting happened in like one go. So I didn't, we didn't, we didn't make all three back to back. And it's obviously changed a lot from then. But the, but when we started, we had like three albums worth of songs. So we were always just kind of building on these things and stripping things away, and you know, sort of liken it to a sculptor chiseling at something rather than building up. You know, so mm -hmm. we always had this mass that we were kind of breaking oh, down okay yeah so the so the second part was disillusionment which meant we got to be a bit more angry and uh and we were certainly by sort of coincidence in that state as a band where we where we'd gone from it being this fun thing that we were doing because we wanted to and then suddenly it started to become serious and so record labels get involved agents get involved and gigs and it all starts to matter you know how many tickets you sell and all that kind of stuff so we sort of channeled the disillusionment of that stuff and poured that into the record, um, which, like I say, was the, the kind of father figure of the of the three. Um, but the nice thing with that was that we we always knew we were aiming at the third album, which was about faith um, through a motherly lens, and that was a, that was something we were always looking forward to. You know, it was because uh -huh. it was going to be this cathartic thing. So it was a, it was a, it was a good idea in hindsight to plan it that way because. It kind of it the story told itself you know what i mean we didn't need to right. think about how to tell it it was it was just kind of there which is uh -huh. cool you know? that's interesting so i mean if, if you put out uh proud disturber of the peace in 2017 so you're looking mm -hmm. four years ahead for this record yeah. was it hard to like i mean like not release it back to back to back really quickly like how did you go about was, managing the, that we did like there was a there was a vague plan to do it quickly Mm -hmm. That was, I think because like one of the things I always liked as a music fan, my favorite thing was when I discovered an artist that already had a back catalog. So mm -hmm. like, like, like discovering Tom Waits when I was 21 or whatever, and, and having this treasure trove to work through, that sure. was my favorite thing. So I had this idea that, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to bang, 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 just put albums out constantly so that we can become that band that if somebody discovers us, they'll be like, holy shit, there's like, 10 records yeah. or whatever right right so, right so that was the original plan but then the minute you start getting serious and having legal obligations and signing to labels and stuff it just slows the process down so yeah so we ended up being like a couple of years between the first two records and then this one obviously mm -hmm. we've had covid so it's been right scary. yeah pushed so it we, up. we kind of gave up on the speedy thing and thought actually it's, it's no bad thing to take your time with these things and um, you know let them soak in a little bit but as far as songwriting, like you said, you had this whole batch of songs and it was like mm. chipping away. And for, like, were you writing? I'm sure you guys were writing other songs that maybe didn't fit into the mm -hmm. realm of the three records. Yeah. yeah or no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. Yeah. It was, it was the, it was the themes as much as anything. Cause it, the, so like a way to, that I like to think about it is cause I, cause of the, so if you think about the novel, the novel's called William the Conqueror, and it's written mm -hmm. from a 19 year old's perspective on his childhood. Whereas the songs are songs about that same childhood, but told from my, you know, whatever, mid thirties point of view. So there's like a, a mature angle and an immature angle to the stories. Sure. So, so the first album was much more about the infancy and the innocence. And the second one was about adolescence and that stuff. And then the, the third one's about the, the point at which you're ready to kind of grow up and and, and uh, take life a bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. So in the, the the best kind of writing for me anyway, the kind of writing I like to do is where you're not really thinking about what you're writing. You're just letting the pen do the talking, thinking about things and mm -hmm. writing them down and assembling ideas. Um, so there are always, there are always themes, you know, like a right. So the Maverick think of the title track of the new album it's actually, you know, I wrote it like three or four years ago and I just wow. knew that it was kind of sitting there waiting for album three. So sometimes it was like that where you purposefully put things aside. Other times it was like, that's, we like this song too much to wait. So let's just bang it on this one instead. You know, it's, okay. quite, it's quite, it's quite free flowing. We're not strict in, in terms sure. of the presentation, you know? Okay. So, okay. Well yeah. with the, but I mean, you just, you guys just released um maverick thinker what like mm -hmm. a few days ago right on the fifth yeah friday yeah it came out friday congratulations yeah. on that that's Thanks, awesome Thank you. Yeah. um but where were you guys when it when COVID all hit like where where were you at um we were in los angeles recording it 
when it happened. Oh, because you guys recorded at Sun yeah. City, right? S Sound City. Yeah, oh, Sound City. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, uh, yeah. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it, know, was that, um, wow, that must have been a huge experience in itself. It was. Yeah, it was amazing. And, it, and again, just it fell into our ethos, really, of part of our thing was never to go searching. You know, it was just to let things come to us. So making a record with Ethan, we sort of thought, well, that's our peak. We've peaked. That's awesome. Let's, but I'd have been happy with that. But then, yeah, the opportunities to record in Sound City, it was like, oh no, there is another level. You know, <laughs> we can we can go there. And the coolest thing about recording in Sound City, being like someone that was brainwashed with Bob Dylan, was that he he was in there recording Rough and Rowdy Ways like uh, the the week before we went. Whoa! So, yeah, so we get we actually got bumped for him. We were due to go at the <laughs> beginning of March, and then we got the phone call saying, "Listen, you guys are going to have to push your recording time back." But we we they wouldn't tell us why because oh. it was all under wraps. Yeah, sure, and, sure. And I, I eventually, managed to like needle it out of Joseph, our producer, and it was because Bob Dylan wanted to record his new record in there. So, wow, that's that huge. was cool. That's, that that's was cool. really cool. And then yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously, growing up with grunge you said um and, and nirvana, nirvana never record. Mind, yeah. machine absolutely yeah, yeah. so it's, it was per i couldn't have thought of a better place to record the final album you know that was all about having faith in what you do you know right i mean yeah um, wow it, it, when you go in there is there just like a like a an aura to it? like i can't i've never oh, yeah. been in there i can't imagine like i'm sure it's just like a totally Good different time. energy i mean you have the Definitely. amount of greats that have been in there mm -hmm yeah yeah for sure but i didn't i tried not to let it get to me we we visited on the first day we weren't we weren't working we just went to have a little look around and look at some of the equipment and stuff so i used that as the opportunity to to do the thing of standing in awe like nerd like out. Around, well. <laughs> but then but then when we started recording we sort of didn't really have any choice but to get focused and just you know at least act like we had the right to be there you know <laughs> Right, um, which is what we did. So, so we just worked really hard, and you you sort of forget about the ore until you come out for like a lunch break, and you sit in the in the foyer, and there's all these gold discs around. And you go, oh, yeah, oh yeah, we're in Sound City. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So you had this opportunity. You're there when when COVID hits. And yeah. Obviously, you finished the record, but how far along mm -hmm. were you when in 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 LA was I? I mean, I'm I was I'm from Southern California, so I know LA mm -hmm. was really bad yeah yeah we, did, we didn't we didn't really notice like we were in a we we're in a, a full-on album making bubble so we were just we'd go from airbnb to studio pretty much mm -hmm. and then occasionally we'd take a trip to the supermarket to get some supplies and the shelves would be a little bit emptier and the queues would be slightly bigger and it was just kind of strange we didn't really know what was going on just these whispers of this thing that was happening and then i think with with about four days left yeah, the, the call just came in saying that, listen, you guys are going to have to leave, you know, you're gonna, so we didn't get to finish our time in there. Luckily, the workflow had been so good that we'd finished everything anyway. And uh, okay. we, were, we were planning on just dicking around for the last four days. <laughs> <laughs> but they um, shooed you out. Well, with yeah. that, like, did you, were you guys on a plane pretty quickly and, and heading yeah. back home? Like, yeah, to, next to... day, next day. Okay. Yeah. The bummer was that my, my friend Luke, Kellett, who uh, runs a creative company out in Australia, like as soon as I heard I was going to Sound City, he was the first person I called and said, dude, you need to come over and uh -huh. take some photos of us. So he flew out on uh, whatever day it was and arrived and came to the studio, took a few pictures, but then the jet lag hit him and he fell asleep. And it was like, dude, don't worry, we've got another four days. We've got loads of time. Yeah. And then the, the next morning he was told, you know, you, you can't come back in. I'm sorry, you can't go home. So oh he flew all the way from God. Sydney for, for one for morning. One Oh my gosh. Well, at least you guys got to document it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the last day, so we changed our flights and on the last day um, we had a morning before we needed to get to the airport. So we went down to Venice beach with his super eight camera Oh, and cool. just thinking it would be a like vibrant, cool place to take some pictures and shoot some film, but there was no one around. It was like Cormac McCarthy novel or something. It was just, <laughs> just homeless people and nothing, just rubbish everywhere. It was, it was pretty bizarre. I yeah. was going to say, that's probably a pretty cool thing to capture, though, as well. I mean, yeah. seeing photos of downtown LA and like the 405 with like no cars on it, yeah. like those pictures are just so, pretty like weird. I said, so yeah. bizarre. Uh -huh. I think we, we used the footage for a music video, the Quiet Life single. The video for that is is the footage that we shot on Venice. Oh, Beach. really? Mm, yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was cool.
So we got so, some good stuff out of it. But. Yeah. Well, when you when you get back um, and you have this record, mm -hmm. was it like mixed and mastered there, like without you guys, or done like this way over Zoom? Like how how did how did you guys continue uh, to put um, the album together? So Joseph, who mixed it and produced it with us, um, it was in a really good place when we left. You know, there wasn't you could tell what needed doing to it. So it wasn't a complicated thing. And he he kind of took it home and um, would just send mixes through. And they were, they were bang on pretty much every time. Okay. There wasn't much that needed doing. Um, it was just a shame, you know, it's just like unfinished business because it would have been cool, obviously, to be there and uh, finish it together. But, you know, how much can you yeah. wish, you know, at this time? Sure, sure. <laughs> and when you guys got back, I mean, obviously you're you're inside. Were you are you working on like now? What I mean, you have the trilogy out. Is uh -huh. there going to be another? Do you have, you have yeah? Ideas I have. For the I have. Project? I have figured out how to continue it because it because it felt like it was a close because it ties in with the book as well, and the book obviously finishes, but the book finishes when he's twenty. Williams twenty, so. Yeah, I have managed to figure out a way of continuing the William story, but it being relevant to where we're at now. So there will be another record, yeah, and another book. Um, oh, and awesome. that, yeah, that, that's what I've been doing for the, for lockdown. Basically, I've, I made a podcast, or we made a podcast back at the start that I, like I adapted the book into a podcast. Um, okay, I was listening to the first episode. I was well, oh, okay, wondering. Cool. Okay, yeah, so yeah, it is yeah. it is the book that you wrote. Because yeah, you're, yeah. you're reading it. I mean, from what it's I just was me, thinking. it's me, it's me reading it. Right. Uh, okay. Pretending to be a 19 year old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was good because it was a merging of like all of the, because I use the, the music as the soundtrack to it as well. Mm -hmm. So all the music's in there and that was a fun project to do. But um, now that that's over and yeah, I needed something else to do. So, I, so I started working on new things while we were waiting for the, for the new album to come out and obviously making the videos and, Things like that's been fun, but <clears throat> touring the album would be would, would, was the thing that we're looking forward to most. And sure, you know, there's whispers, there's whispers of gigs maybe this year, so we'll see. Yeah, I've actually been hearing, yeah, towards May, mm. April, May, that they might even really? like October. I mean, here, like to a very, I heard today somebody told me that New York might be doing shows of like a hundred cap. Oh, so still socially distanced. Yeah, but yeah, okay. still, I mean, lot, right now we're in the States really not doing anything. I mean, yeah. in most places. <laughs> it's brutal, uh, isn't it? Yeah, so they're doing, I know, but it's funny because I'll talk to somebody in like, you know, Australia and they're playing shows or New mm. Zealand, they're doing shows. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. so it's it's interesting, but um, yeah, I don't know. But then I've also heard like fall everyone's yeah. gonna it's gonna be open to every you know but we'll the, see. yeah yeah that's the yeah fall and there's a few festivals over here a couple of the big festivals like reading um have announced uh, but they can't get insurance so i don't know i don't know i'm just like as a defense mechanism i just refuse to get my hopes up i'm just kind of waiting <laughs> sure. i'm assuming that there's like i took the position of thinking um okay rather than be bummed out about the fact that there's no gigs i'm going to pretend i live in a world where there's no such thing as a gig and soon someone's going to invent this fucking amazing thing called a gig <laughs> and everyone's going to go bonkers so i'm waiting for that that's my philosophy i just wait <laughs> i love that what about like going live on instagram or anything like that or Facebook? no, do that no. Now? With, uh, again oh, that's one of those things like it would have been really easy to jump on the bandwagon of doing those streaming right. from your home things but because we're or because i like to think about the william project as if it's this invented persona like this meta version of me or whatever it's not the kind of thing he would do so that uh, was our kind of reason for not really doing it because it was i like that it was just kind of against his principle which is a shame because <laughs> it would have been quite nice to do one but you should have talked be, him to, into it <laughs> oh, no, he's, a, he's, a, he's annoying he's a bit of a pain in the ass sometimes <laughs> William, but, but it was more it was more to do with that like a sort of creative choice not to not not to uh, he, he just it, like it's an avoidance of bandwagons i think is 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 something that we try and avoid it's like if, if anybody starts <laughs> if it starts to look like we're part of the popular crowd <laughs> like, <laughs> you gotta go leave off in a different direction yeah, yeah. <laughs> i love that well i i can't wait till, till everything opens up and you guys can yeah. actually have a chance to, to so, tour so the where, are, where are you where are you now um actually i'm in now I'm in Nashville, but I just oh, moved Nashville, here okay. like like literally a week and a half ago. I'm from oh, San Diego no in Southern mm -hmm. California. So I 
my family and I have been <clears throat> were there for my our whole lives. So yeah, um, <clears throat> we just made a made the big trip across yeah. country and uh, we've been here. That's why there's absolutely nothing in this room. Two <laughs> posters. Yeah, yeah. Was that <laughs> like a was that like a, a last minute thing? Was it like were you part of the the supposed mass exodus out of LA or? Uh, I was mean, that, was that not a, a little thing? bit? Yeah, they call us California refugees. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little bit. It was kind of on both ends. I mean, yeah. the podcast is through American Songwriter, which is based here in in Nashville, and uh -huh. a lot of people we talk to are from here. So, okay. it's just been a. We've we, we've been to Nashville twice, you know. We had a really good time over there. Absolutely oh, awesome! Place. Yeah, yeah. So we hope to get back there for sure. We did some well, good shows there. Yeah, we're gonna be, we're putting <laughs> together a studio here. So uh, once oh, cool. everything opens up and shows are back, um, mm -hmm. we're hoping to have people like you come come over and, and do this in person. Oh, amazing! Yeah, we'd love to do that. That'd be yeah, awesome. That'd be a, that'd be great if you yeah, yeah if you guys would join us. But thank you so much, man, for for chatting with me today. I really appreciate My pleasure. it. I have yeah, one more yeah. question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Um, well, I could steal, I could steal some advice uh, from Charles Bukowski, who's got it on his gravestone. It says, don't try. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's good advice, man, because it's, uh, you know, just from my own experiences of, being in that position where you, th what, what I thought was necessary to be an artist and a creative was to try and please everybody. But actually it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. If you, if you push all of that aside, it doesn't, it doesn't mean don't try and work hard or don't, or it doesn't mean don't try and do good or anything like that. It just means don't try and impress the people that aren't necessarily, I don't, don't try and impress anybody else except yourself. You know, it, it has to be coming from a, an honest place. And if you let that happen, then, things seem to come to you, you know? So yeah, don't try. Bring me a bad word.